started and um, welcome you to technical session number six, Cultivating the Creativity of Innovation. So the um, standard reminders, the Wi-Fi code, if you're on the Marriott's uh, Wi-Fi, is all caps, R-I-C, RIC 2024. Um, there are QR codes up here. Uh, please scan that and give us your best questions and don't forget your feedback at the end. Uh, we thrive on feedback. Uh, those of you that are internal to NRC know that I've been very curious about NRR's workload perspectives. I'm all about feedback, so please, please, please give us feedback. It will help us. Um, we're going to have live polling questions in this session. So the text number to submit your polling questions is 2233. Three. So that's two, two, three, three, three. Um, so you should be able to see them when they come up using the uh, QR code. There's tabs in there. If you need your magnifier glasses, you can turn your phone sideways and it'll help you um, if you need to, to click in those tabs, but they are there. Um, what else? Oh, all of these sessions are recorded. So um, give us your questions, and we will do our best to get through them all. And your question will be famous on the internet, known as the NRC RIC website. So with that, I would like to ask for poll question number one to go on up. Um, it's my understanding there's about a 30 second delay for the folks that are joining us in the ether on the internet on our web platform. So we'll give them some time to participate in our polling question. And the question is, what does innovation look like? So while you're answering those questions, I'd like to do some introductions here because I'm very happy to be sitting on this stage with this illustrious group of professionals. Uh, my name is Melissa Walker and I'm the director of Embark. I sit in the Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation, working for Andrea Vale, who has very graciously joined us today, um, sitting in the front fan club. Um, very happy to have some innovators and um, next-gen people supporting us here and um, c contributing to the conversation, because I know that they're loading questions for us. Um, the Embark Venture Studio is the NRC's Innovation and Transformation Accelerator. We partner with NRC personnel across the entire agency. We don't just do NRR activities. And we support the uh, program at corporate offices to facilitate experimentation and prototyping. So really what we're trying to do is remove barriers and help our very smart people do their jobs better, more effectively, more efficiently. And we also have the opportunity to partner with our licensees on a variety of products designed to help to transmit information back and forth more readily. Many of you know that as MAPX, Mission Analytics Portal External. So today's session is Cultivating the Creativity of Innovation, and we have some exciting panel of experts here, and they're going to talk about fostering creative and innovative environments in their parts of the world. And we did a little math, and um, we figured that Sitting up here, we have over 100 years worth of good, bad, and ugly work experience. So um, take advantage of, of what you can learn in this session and share with others. Um, so first, I'd like to introduce M Mr. Milton Valentin. He's the acting branch chief for the Human Factors and Reliability Branch in the Office of Nuclear Regulatory Research, home of the Innovate NRC 2.0 program. Milton and his staff provide technical support to ensure that innovative ideas are considered for implementation across the NRC. Milton has held a number of positions in NRC and commercial engineering firms. He's also a registered professional engineer, not something I can claim to be. Milton, as part of my introduction, can you tell us what your favorite question is and why? Well, good afternoon, everyone, and I'm glad to see that this microphone is loud and clear. Uh, it's been a day. Uh, I would say that uh, I'm also very happy to be here and uh, share some of the experiences that we have gathered as uh, the uh, group that leads innovation in the agency. I would say that my favorite question is typically 
how are you doing? And it could go all sorts of ways. So you just need to know when to ask me when this is going. If you want to have a good time, my friends and colleagues would know, hey, Milton, what's going on? And they will, they will hear some stories. But it is, it is important to be genuine and honest about what's happening because uh, there's, there's a lot of change. And there are many opportunities that we should not take for granted when, when we say how things are going. So I would like to embrace that spirit of, of being genuine and sharing what's actually happening. Because you never know. Somebody may be going through a similar situation. Maybe they may have some solutions that you may want to consider. So that would be my favorite question. All right. Thank you, Milton. So how's it going is not just a I'm fine response for you. Good to know. I'll tuck that away. Thank you. All right, Ms. Tina Taylor is a Senior Director of Research and Development at the Electric Power Research Institute, or EPRI. The first time I heard EPRI, I was like, what does that stand for? It is the Electric Power Research Institute, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, Tina is responsible for nuclear innovation and leads EPRI's engagement and collaboration with the global nuclear community. Tina has worked in the electric power industry over 30 years, and she holds a degree in chemical engineering. Tina, what's your favorite question and why? Thanks for having me as part of the panel today. Um, I have a lot of great cocktail party questions, so if I catch up with you later, I'm happy to share those. But in the context of fostering creativity and promoting innovation, I like to ask people, how can we make that happen? Because a lot of times when somebody has a new idea, there's an instinct to say that can't happen because, or you have to think about this barrier. But if I, if I ask it that way, then we can work through together what are all the things that people have to think about to make something happen. And I usually get convinced rather quickly that it's possible when my first gut instinct might be that it's not. Mm, that's a good question. Thank you. Next to Tina, we have Mr. Christopher Chris Craighead. He is the NRC Agency Culture Lead in the Office of the Executive Director for Operations. And he heads a team in development and strategy execution, fostering an ideal work culture. Prior to joining NRC, Chris stood up the new Atlanta Office of Medicare Appeals on behalf of the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services. Chris has a career success in building highly engaged and productive workforces, delivering key mission-centered programs and products. Chris has a degree in legal studies. Chris, can you tell us your favorite question and why? Yes, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for, for having me on the panel. Um, so I like your questions. Um, I think for me, a, a good question is, what's new? I think in the spirit of innovation, um, as we encounter different challenges and problems in the workplace, we're kind of always thinking about them and how to get around them, how to deal with the barriers that you alluded to. And, um, you know, knowing what's on the top of someone's mind will probably let you know what they've been thinking about in terms of solutions and, and workarounds. So um, that's one thing that I, I try to ask myself is, okay, what's new? What's my focus? You know, what's, what's the next step? How do, I, how do I get around this? It's a very good question. Thank you, Chris. And last but certainly not least, we have Mr. Luis Bedencourt. And he's the chief of the Accident Analysis Branch in the Office of Nuclear Regulatory Research, where he leads a diverse team and research portfolio, including space nuclear, consequence analysis, and delivery of the first ever NRC Artificial Intelligence Strategic Plan. Luis held several positions previously in the NRC, and he's also a registered professional engineer. Luis, what's your favorite question and why? Well, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. It's great to connect with all of you. One of the questions that I always ask to my staff and to myself is, are we trying to solve the right problem or are we trying to solve the convenient ones? And I always ask that question often because we tend to go always with the noise rather than rather than to focus on what is the end goal that we're trying to achieve. So it's always a, a way to reset our, our mindset, okay, what are we trying to solve and what is the chance of solving it? So that's one of my favorite questions that I always tend to ask to me and to my staff. 
Thank you, Luis. So it looks like we have all of our responses in on what does innovation look like. And it looks like most of you believe that it looks like process improvement followed by better tool implementation. Uh, and then there's a tie for regular technological overhauls and different organizational structures. Thank you for giving us that feedback and helping us understand that from your perspective, process improvement and tool implementation are innovation. What I'd like to do today, if we can have the speaker slide back up, um, is, is talk a little bit more and delve into innovation. Um, we've defined it as to make something different. So think about it in terms of three ways of thinking. You have incremental, you have expansive, and you have disruptive. So if you think about incremental, then what you're looking at is improving a process, a method, a way of doing business, like a wrench. You have a wrench, you can tighten a bolt. Um, you have a wrench, you can take your tag bolts off of your car and, re and replace your tag if you, if you move out of state. So there's a process improvement there. You're complying with the laws of, of wherever it is you've, you've moved to. And it's the same in our industry, process improvement, it can be an incremental process where you make micro changes and they lead to larger changes. And when you think about expansive, you're making something more accessible. It's a broader reach or a uh, capacity. Think of the rotary phone to your smartphone. That's a pretty expansive change. You went from, I can pick up the phone and call someone and I'm tied to a certain location with a certain device to, I have this phone where I can still call people, but I'm not tied to a location, and I can also do email, and I can take cool pictures from the stage, or maybe I can do some artificial intelligence leaning type things with this device that used to just be for making a phone call tied to a certain location. So there's also disruptive, and that's to render something obsolete or replaced with something better. Think the candle for your day-to-day -day lighting situation to the light bulb. That was utterly disruptive. How many of us use candles to do our work in the evening? I would venture to say none of us. No one online and no one here. We like to have them for ambiance, but we're not doing business processes with our candles, at least not in this industry. Maybe some of the others, but not this one. So that sort of sets the stage for you in terms of the terms that we're using and how we define them. Incremental, expansive, disruptive are all part of the innovating, making something different. So today, I'm gonna put my speakers in the hot seat. But first, we're gonna do poll number two. How do you think innovation makes you productive and successful? Again, the text is 22333 three, three, if you want to send in your answers. And we've already got, nope, we've got some. Some of you are very fast with your texting. Um, while you're doing that and the answers are coming in, um, I'm going to ask my speakers, are our organizations empowered to drive innovation. I want to say that again. Are our organizations empowered to drive innovation? Milton, you want to kick us off? Um, sure. Um, I can tell our uh, story from the NRC side and we are actively working in empowering different segments of, of the agency. Um, innovation is happening. Uh, we have a long history with innovation. It's, it's nothing new. But now with the NRC innovation program, which we call the Innovate NRC 2.0, we are looking at those innovation pockets within the agency and we're trying to leverage those, uh, those synergies to understand how the internal processes are changing, how we are benefiting from those changes, and where are those changes happening so that we can see how the agency is transforming and, and in that sense supporting our, our transformational goals to become a uh, risk-informed modern regulatory uh, agency. So I would say that there's, there's work to be done, but certainly we are devoting resources to make sure that our organization is empowered to, to thrive in innovation. Very good. 
I appreciate that, Milton. So you see the Innovate 2.0 program as reaching beyond NRC as well because we're bringing in additional thoughts on how we can do better from the ideas within, but the kinds of conversations we're having. Absolutely. We, uh, we are networking and socializing with other organizations that are also pursuing innovation. Uh, we are trying to build a network of people that understand what's happening and that could share lessons learned and opportunities for us to just learn from each other and and just uh, keep addressing the key issues that we see. There's a lot of common themes out there and certainly if we talk, if we collaborate, we could get further working together. I agree with you and I think Tina has something she wants to add to that on what EPRI is doing along the same sorts of lines. Yeah, I'm thinking about how lucky I am for the type of organization that I work in for this question uh, because we're, we're all about innovation and research. Um, and I would say I, I want to talk maybe a little bit about within EPRI and then the, the industry as a whole. Um, within EPRI, we are deliberate about innovation. So we um, set aside money to work on deliberately innovative ideas. We have internal competitions for that. We give prizes for that. We ask those kind of questions as we hire people. But ultimately, the things that we innovate are really only most valuable if they're then adopted by the whole industry. And I would say right now I see a, a batch of leadership in the industry that's hungry for innovation that is trying to understand what they can do within their organization to foster that, which is great to see. But there is this reality, even within EPRI, and, and certainly a little bit more so with the industry at large, that innovative ideas crash into the day-to-day -day need to run the business. So we can give somebody um, uh, money to go work on a project that they find innovative, but then we still expect them to do their time card and have a budget for that and get a report done on a certain period of time. So I think we're in that phase right now where there's a lot of hunger for it and a good head start, but there's more to go to really unleash everybody's best ideas, I think. That's a really good point. I think you have offered some badges or things or coins through innovation, but sounds like you offer real prizes in uh, every... <laughs> well, a prize means you get to spend time on this and go work on it. Oh. So it's, it, it could be a, an assignment. <laughs> well, we, we try and frame it like a prize. <laughs> It is, it is all in context, right? They, some people love their job so much that they <laughs> thrive just doing it. But, but no, I would say the NRC, actually, we have done some work to uh, standardize the recognition for uh, innovation. We have our um, annual uh, innovation celebration uh, ceremony. And there are uh, prizes, not only recognition, but there's also uh, a lot of, of visibility and opportunities to share uh, the work that has been done, hoping that all people can appreciate the power of innovation and, and that, that collaboration that happens when people come together and having similar issues or, or just having similar interests and they come up with a solution faster and they implement that solution and they see the efficiencies that could be gained and then more people learn about hey they did this I could do this too so it's it's not only what we're trying to do with recognition but also the the effort in shifting the culture to make this innovative mentality more more consistent and and just to be something natural that happens without us having to point out hey good job this is this is great we can use this uh, so it's it's something that is taking time but it's happening, mm -hmm. so uh, certainly looking forward to see what else comes out of, of the brilliant minds of the NRC. Ooh, brilliant minds. Um, and that leads me to Chris, because you said something about um, impacting the culture and um, creating this atmosphere of innovation. Um, Chris, I know you have some deep thoughts on the subject. Yeah, so thank you. So yeah, very well said, Milton. So, you know, in culture, you know, it, it's, you know, often think about how do you innovate culture work, right? And so I was glad to see that we had 
some responses on organizational structure, right? Because there's things that we've been able to do from a structural standpoint that help us really focus and pinpoint on areas of culture that we want to really focus on and improve. Um, and so we've talked a lot about this new culture leader model that we've, we've done in the agency and instituted um, that allows us to leverage the strengths that you just spoke about, Milton, the things that are going on well with innovation and figure out, okay, what are the behaviors that are driving this success and how can we uh, spread this across the rest of the organization? Um, and so we're looking at different ways to manage culture, influence culture, um, which has been really great. And then a part of that obviously includes how do we create the right culture uh, for our organization as a whole, um, looking at specific behaviors that we've learned drive innovation. So, you know, one thing is important is, you know, sharing ideas and, and making them open and making people aware of the ideas that are out there. Typically what happens is when their ideas put out there, you know, people hear about it and they go, oh, I like that. And oh, I can contribute to that. Oh, we can actually make that idea better. And I've already seen that, that evolution uh, here in the NRC when putting different things on the table. Um, one thing that's really helpful with that is spending time questioning our current practices and our current approaches to things. Um, which I found to be very helpful, something that we can do more of here at the NRC. Uh, typically, we'll put an idea out there, and sometimes we'll spend a lot of time questioning the new idea, when really should spend more time questioning our current practices. Um, so all these type of behaviors that we're looking at really are helpful in helping to foster uh, what we would call a, a more ideal culture. Thank you, Chris. And that sort of ties into what you were saying, Tina, in terms of um, your prize is more work. Um, it sounds like we have more work to do on our cultural indicators, uh, the results of our efforts on uh, doing innovation and how do we incorporate that. And I'm sure that many of you find that same sort of thing in the pockets of the organizations that you work in. Um, you feel like I would like to change something, so how do I do that? How do I innovate? How do I step in uh, and make these these impacts? Thank you. So, Luis, we haven't touched on um, tech too much, uh, but you've been around for a minute. In fact, uh, you're a former Rick, uh, a Rick uh, important person. Um, I forgot what the right term is. Uh, you were a co-champion. Co-champion. You were a co-champion too. So uh, we've got. We really do have some experts up here. Hey, Tina, you got it next year. <laughs> you that, Andrea? You got it. I, the way they described it wasn't necessarily fun, but um, they said it was... Uh, oh, it, it was fun. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so we haven't really brought in tech too much, but you've got a keen interest in what's going on with our artificial intelligence um, capabilities, potential, not just what's going on out in industry, but what's going on in the NRC. Um, and it sort of touches on our culture of how do we... How do we expand what we're doing and how do we innovate in areas that maybe we don't have as much expertise? Yeah. So I think that's a really good question because when people think about innovation, they think always about AI. How can AI make our life more easier? And one of the things that we have been doing on the area of AI, at least at the agency, it is something that is not new. We tend to be a very data-driven organization, and AI is basically another tool in our toolbox. And one of the things that we have been finding in the early days before ChatGPT and everything that came into place, we had this thing that is called like a diffusion focus research program. And one of the things that that program has helped us is to try to find those ambers within the organization to think about in the next five to 10 years, <clears throat> how can this technology make our life easier and what it has helped us before all of this wave of AI came into place is to build that foundational knowledge to be able to cultivate an AI-ready workforce. Now recently, uh, what we have been seeing is that the agency has been more like the sun that is trying to irradiate of how can we as an agency be able to use this technology to improve the way that we work. And we are not alone as, a, as an agency. The whole federal government is actually now pushing us to be able to look more of how AI could be used in the way that we work in order to drive innovation. So recently, I think you heard the chair talk about this today, he basically tasked the whole agency to think about how AI could be used to improve the way that we work. It was a very challenging task that we're still in the process of working upon it. But one thing that I love about the 
project that we have so far is that the show was basically like the one that he was able to eradicate this culture of, okay, we have this technology, how can we make it better? So we were able to bring all of the 23 offices and including the regions to start talking, hey, how can we use AI in order to improve our licensing, rulemaking, environmental, and so forth? And one of the things that we have found is that people have a lot of great ideas and that didn't happen by chance. It happened because we had this Ambers uh, through the focus research program as well as all of these pockets of staff across the organization and now they're starting to come up and one of the things that we're planning to move forward is okay we're going to be embracing AI as a way for us to cultivate this technology to be able to innovate and to, to be able to improve the way that we work. Uh, more to come on that. We're going to be able to release some of that information uh, in the, hopefully in the, in the next month or so. But I think that's what, what is really important. Sometimes you want to have those ambers to be able to grow up, and sometimes you want to be like the sun that you're able to drive all of the chains of the organization. And at the NRC, we have done both, and that is something very important that you're talking about innovation. It's about the people. It's not about the organization. So as long as you have the people to be able to cultivate uh, and foster that knowledge and, and, um, and to be able to use that, People naturally want to solve problems. They want to be able to, to make our lives easier. And at the end of the day, it's all about, goes back to the human. It's all goes about culture. Thanks, Luis. That's a really good point about the culture. And you see that in um, the responses here. Uh, number one, that your work must be connected to purpose. And where do you get your purpose? It's being driven by the culture. Um, there are some some noted academics that, that talk about the drive to improve is driven by not only enjoying the people that you work with, but buying into the environment that you're in on a daily basis and how much time you spend in that environment and how you can engage with it. So thank you. Uh, most of you think it has to be connected to purpose and that you have to develop and build bridges between all parts of the organization. And so I would say, uh, I, I hope that you see that representation here on the stage. Um, we have representatives from across um, the NRC and our, our one, uh, every uh, participant, thank you so much for um, coming in to have this kind of conversation um, on, a, on a more personal conversational level as opposed to presenting a, a paper and a technical presentation that um, you've got to be fast with your note taking or you miss the statistics. So we have some statistics. We'll, um, we'll move along to our um, next sets. And I just want to sort of encapsulate the comments that I've heard here. Um, what I think I've heard is that for us to have a value for our organizations to be empowered to drive innovation, that benefit has to outweigh the cost for us to really have a value, for us to have that buy-in um, for participation and for delivery. Uh, we heard from the commissioners this morning, as well as the chair, he said, we have to understand our why, we have to look at our why, and we heard from Commissioner um, Caputo that we must deliver results. So at the end of the day, we can't have innovation for innovation's sake, you wanna connect it to your purpose and to your points and involve the people and give them the right skill sets and set the, the right kinds of culture. So thank you, and I see that poll number three is, is up here. What are the characteristics of the most innovative organizations? So while those are coming in, I'll pose the next question to our uh, panelists here. Do our mechanisms for success build capability and enable people to deliver? Think about that in terms of your own organizations while they're thinking up their answers. Um, do our mechanisms for success build capability and enable people to deliver? What do you think, Milton? Well, how, how do you define success? And that's, that's the key. Like, if we understand what success means for the organization or the poor, the the segment of the organization that you work for, that would make it easier for you to identify what are going to be the most beneficial uh, goals or activities to to work towards. So it is, again, important to communicate and have a common understanding of what are the 
um, organization priorities, uh, what 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 is success for for that organization, and then everything will just happen naturally because everyone likes to be successful. That's by itself is motivation, uh, but at the same time, how are we building from that success and coping with the changes that are happening and just uh, understanding what are our uh, clients or constituents needs in order to continue being successful because challenges are going to continue to change mm -hmm. so it is it is important to keep understanding the landscape and also to communicate with your management with your team and understand what are the with with your stakeholders it, it's important to understand the landscape and the challenges to be able to identify success hopefully that that will just then cascade into good things that's a really good point how do we define success some people define success by you know how much money they have in the bank some people define success on how well they're integrated across their organizations some people define success as being good at what they do and being happy with what they do uh, that's a really valid and interesting point on that question um, do our mechanisms for success how are we defining success within our, our divisions our um, branches our organizations our companies, our piece of the company. Um, how does EPRI define success in in your uh, in your parts of things? Yeah, that's a that's a really tough question because when I think about how people define success, I go straight to KPIs. I don't know, maybe other people do too. Um, you know, I think one of our one of the things we hold on to tightly is value for our members. That's mm. that's what we try to focus on and measure. And it's sometimes hard to draw a straight line between that and innovation. Mm. So I, th I think about innovation more as it's one of your foundational qualities you want in your company. Like we have, like many people probably have definition of what your, what your core qualities or attributes are. You know, these are things like teamwork, things like leadership, integrity. And so I put innovation kind of alongside those things. It's, it's a necessary aspect of your culture to have and to promote to then be able to run whatever it is, the business you're trying to run on top of that. So I think about it that way. That's a great perspective. Uh, Chris, you look like you're ready to jump in um, <laughs> on uh, the identification of how you define it within your culture. Um, yes. I think we've seen within the NRCs some desired culture that maybe we don't all possess yet, but we're working on it. Yes, we're working on it. That's a great way to put it. <laughs> so I think we're talking about the characteristics of innovative organizations. There has to be um, the capacity for taking risk. Um, it's a very important part of having some bandwidth for, in order to get to success, you have to have some room for failure. Um, some trial and error, some experimentation. And so I think um, those are things that we could look more closely at at the NRC. Um, I think as a whole, we could gravitate from being a little bit less perfectionistic in how we approach our work. You know, being regulators and inspectors, we're very trained uh, to just be precise and on point in everything that we do. But when it comes to innovation and thinking differently and trying something new, it's gotta be a little bandwidth there to, to, to fail. And even not just necessarily fail, but have something to learn from and build on. So those are some things that I think factor in success along with what you said, Tina, I like what you said about the values. All those things can be done within the context of our organizational values, which we hold close. So I think having a little room to, to experiment and try something new in the context of our values will get us to where we want to go in terms of success. That's a great point. Um, typically, large bureaucratic organizations are structured to grind risk out because bureaucratic institutions are designed to defend the bureaucracy. And like you were talking about safety culture, you know, it's really important that we have our steps and our, our standardization and the proper ways of executing our mission but at the same token, we're talking about innovation and needing to take some risk and create some space for risk. So how do we define what that risk looks like and how do we step into that? Particularly when we're looking at um, AI and the potential of new tools and techn technological capability, how do we create the space that's safe for risk, but also protects the bureaucratic institution that is in need of defending itself. Um. 
you know, oh. D does the bureaucratic institution need to be preserved? <laughs> <laughs> what a great question. No, I did not. I did not say that, boss. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Talk about taking risks. No, uh, <laughs> look, <laughs> right. <laughs> Mic drop. Yeah, it is, yeah, risk. no, it's hard, hard, hard comment to follow because uh, then I come with my boring thing about like you know, it, there's, there's different ways of looking at risk. It's the, the organizational tolerance that you know, maybe the organization is more risk adverse or not, but there's also the personal risk that you take when you try something new, when you open your mouth with your brilliant idea and people look at you like, what the heck is he talking about? What is <laughs> so? It is. Being innovative is, is being brave. It's putting yourself out there, being, being vulnerable. And, and that is something that, that doesn't always get the recognition that, that it deserves because most of the innovators and the people that discover things, they, they were seen as crazy people. And it's just like in this professional environment, opening your mouth and saying something that hasn't been thought about could be uh, something that may hurt your professional uh, um, reputation to some extent, but what we're trying to do, at least in the NRC, is help those innovators be equipped with the right uh, speech, the right story, so that they can convey those ideas in, in ways that are relatable to the people that are going to listen to those ideas, in ways that connect to the agency priorities. Uh, we have uh, designed, and I, I shouldn't say we, it's actually uh, our innovation team and our contractors, they have put together training courses to uh, help innovators understand what would be the best way to communicate those ideas and to convey and convince and maybe create some momentum so that there's more support when they speak about their ideas. So hopefully that alleviates some of that personal risk that some people may take when they present those ideas. And, and also, it opens the door for people to be more open to uh, listen to things that may not have been uh, proposed before, so that there's openness in, in trying new things and perhaps improving processes that, yeah, they work, don't, don't break it. Well, you know, it's not about breaking the process, it's about improving it. And maybe right. you need to bend it, you need to like crack it up a little so that it changes. But, but that first step, it requires bravery. So um, something to think about. Luis is over there chomping at I have been bit. trying to jump, but I think the conversation is so good. And I think going back to what success means, like at least for me, done is better than perfect. And one of the areas that I think we as organizations need to be looking upon Sometimes we need to let people to fail because through the failures, there are areas that we are able to learn. And at least on the area of AI, that's an area that we are currently working upon. How can we create those sandbox environments where people can test their ideas and people can start testing whether or not this makes sense or not? And if it fails, that's okay because sometimes those failures lead to better ideas or, or leads to better solutions. So that's, the, that's one model that I always tell to my staff, done is better than perfect, so do not try to be able to have perfection in, in the solution. AI is brand new, and I think that's an area that we should expect that there will be some early failures when we start adopting it, but that's part of, of, of a culture of innovation that to those failures, we are able to learn and to be able to have something better at the end of the day. You know, I wanna jump on that one a little bit because we heard the concept of failing, right? And, I, and we, we echo that too. We talk about failing where the consequences are low. Mm -hmm. right. um, and sometimes it's hard to think about where are the consequences low in what we're doing. But just in the, co in the coffee talk this morning, I heard several instances and shared a couple of people playing with AI mm -hmm. in their personal life, right? Not, not to write the next topical report to submit, but I heard somebody made an org chart with Muppet pictures. <laughs> I heard a man- I've seen that before. <laughs> I heard a man uh, used AI to write a love note to his wife and send it to her because he wasn't going to be with her on, um, on Valentine's Day. And then as I was trying to show somebody la last week how to use Copilot, I said, write a bio for Tina Taylor at Epry. And I loved it. I felt so good. This is like my new therapist, I think. <laughs> so people um, t 
touching and playing with different things that are different for them. You know, don't discount the the value of it not being just to do their job, but maybe it's how you run your team meetings or encouraging people to to play with things. You know in their uh, more personally or yeah. have a team event where people can fly a drone or run a robot. And I think uh, that's really kind of things are pretty move us all along in being open minded. Yeah. And I think that's really important. When I look upon where our agency was six months ago, at least on the area of AI, education tends to be really important because we have to demystify what is AI and what is not. Many people think that AI is this shining toolbox that it should be able to solve a lot of our problems. The way that I can think AI is like, how can AI can be, help, be helping me to automate the boring stuff? So I can focus my attention on stuff that is more important to the missions. And I think on that area of, of playing with the tools, that is really important to be able to cultivate an AI-ready workforce because once people start to see the possibilities and the promise of what AI can do, that's when I expect there's going to be an explosion. And that's what I have been seeing in the nuclear industry. Three years ago, I never expected uh, to see the explosion of large language model or something like ChatGPT. Uh, at, the, uh, at the industry. I do see that also coming at, at the NRC. It is expected that we're going to be able to embrace this technology, but that has to happen through education, to your point. Yes. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, no, it's a great conversation. So you can probably tell I've had some experience uh, resisting conformity and kind of stirring the pot a little bit. But um, that's a really critical element. What you touched on earlier, uh, Milton, is, you know, the bravery uh, that's sort of required to say, hey, I think we need to try something different here. And let me voice this or put it out there. I think it's really incumbent on us as an organization to really build that expectation into how we operate and to how we lead and how we influence to create an environment where it's easy for employees to do that. Where we make that an expectation coming in, you know, you're new to the organization, this is where we're at, this is where we're trying to go, and we actually need you to give us different perspectives on our work and how we function and ultimately change the culture. So I think it's such a critical element of innovation. I think that um, that coupled with working across the organization a, a little bit better, uh, having different offices work together on projects will also move the needle on innovation and, and help us be, I think it was said earlier today by one of the commissioners, just be more adaptable to change because change is, is imminent. Those are great points, and it ties right into what you've given us back, that the sustained top-level trust and support are a key element of the characteristics of the most innovative organizations. And being brave sometimes means speaking to management, open management, and, and trying something different and taking a professional risk and, and saying the thing that you're thinking, but not sure how it's going to be received and there has to be a creation of space to allow that risk to be taken there's nothing quite like the shoot the messenger uh, event of you take something in and you've got your fingers chopped off it makes you real excited to go back and try it again right um, so I think I think that you've you've all talked about that um, and the importance that we have in valuing it and celebrating it so how how do we just to carry this a little bit further, how do we reward that? How do we move it forward and say, it is okay to be brave and we want to see more of it? I'll, I'll go first. So I think the one thing that we could focus more on is, and this is all in our data, I know we're a data-driven organization, so if you look closely at where we're at in terms of our culture, um, it's, it's in there, is being more enthusiastic um, showing open enthusiasm toward these new ideas. Um, I think we tend to take a posture where we're more kind of questioning and thinking about it and, and pondering and analyzing every uh, element of a new idea. But we can kind of shift a little bit more towards being more encouraging, um, being more receptive, and okay, we, ha we have this idea. Let's not look at all the ways in which it won't work. Let's look at the things that we can do to make it work. Um, that's just one. That's good. How do we make it work? And I would say, yes, it's, it's important to receive those ideas and, and, and welcome creativity in that sense. But, but it's also important to present a complete story. And, and, and that's the part that, like, sometimes we see a lot of ideas and we see a lot of people with, like, great enthusiasm, but, but the story is not complete. 
and and if you cannot articulate your idea in a way that is uh, providing benefits and pros and cons, it, perhaps you need to think about it, go back, write your speech, do your homework, and come back with a more complete story so that it could be better received. And there's nothing wrong with having friends and other people that could listen to you before you speak to your supervisor or like there's nothing wrong with consulting with your like colleagues it's just having that space like you mentioned where you are comfortable at least opening your mouth for the first time and consulting hey what do you think about this and then work together to have a complete story and then move it forward and perhaps create also some other support from other people that may see potential so just just build your own team come up with a with a group of supporters that may bring more value to your your uh, council of champions to help you work through the ideas um, you played right into what my organization is supposed to do um, we listen and we help with process improvement or ideas or how do I take this data and do something with it how do I show it in a way that will convince my supervisor that it's worth the money or the time or the the people to put into this thing and see if if we can make some incremental change or maybe we can make some really impactful change um, these are these are good um, there looks like there's more thought processes going on over here yeah I, I will say at least when you have talking back to AI where it's still in the early phases of the organization I think to be able to reward those is to celebrate those early wins early and often because I think to, through those early wins, people can start having confidence like, wow, my work is really value, it really matters. And they will have a sense of belonging, like I belong here, I belong in this organization. And that's the way that we can create a culture of innovation that for people to show like I belong in this organization because I was able to make a change and people uh, so uh, were, were able to see how I was able to make that change for everyone. Very good points. So do our mechanisms for success build the capability and enable people to deliver, or are we still building it? Building. Still building it. <laughs> and what does that process look like to build it? Besides making a safe place where you can take risks, well, when, when I was listening to Milton talk, I was thinking about the concept of uh, innovation allies, right? Somebody that hears the idea and then helps those people bring that idea forward, adds the capability around it. Um, I think that's a part of it, is not making people feel like they're going it alone with an idea. Um, but the other thing I'm thinking is, it's important to understand what is a reward for people and what is success for people. And I think that's rapidly changing as our workforce changes. I'm pretty sure it's not the same things I think would be a good reward. Um, so there's probably an element in, of innovation in that, just understanding what it is that does incentivize the particular workforce that you have and, and how to use those incentives to advance innovation. What incentivizes the workforce we have? That's a great question. Um, and I think some people would say it's generational. Some generations want to be paid. They want to get that incentive award. They want to take some cash home. Others are like, no, I want time off. I want flexibility. I want to be able to see my kids' games. Or, um, hey, I want to see my name up in lights. I want to host one of these uh, sessions and get, get this recording that's never ever going to die off the uh, internet. And um, my kids can go see it and see what a dork I am. I'm sorry, what a great parent I am. Um, and so you're right. What, what are the incentives? Um, we see characteristics here um, about drawing from experience at all levels. I think that's something we see at the NRC is people want to be recognized for the work that they do. Uh, and understand how it fits into the mission specifically, not not an esoteric, oh, I think this thing is useful. It's a, this connects to the safety culture in this way, or what I do feeds what we're providing to our licensees, or the licensees are telling me that this product that we put out doesn't work for them because it only works on one computer instead of being able to sign in from anywhere. Um, I think... 
I think we are building it with our tools. Um, I don't know if you want to comment more on where we're going with our AI tools or potential AI tools and how that fits into our overall structure. Um, because if we can get ChatGPT to write some great things for us, maybe maybe that will help us um, reality test some of our ideas, and or maybe it's going to hallucinate and give us um, crazy things. Sure, I can share a little bit more about what we have learned through this exercise of where AI could be used inside of the NRC. So I think there's no surprise that everybody wants their own large language model, some type of a chat GPT uh, for the organization. That's what we saw the majority of the ideas of how can we better mine our data? How can we be better able to learn from this data? And one of the things that people were asking more about uh, when you look upon data, we tend to be a very data-driven organization. And, and we tend to ask, am I getting the right result? But I think with AI, it's a little bit different. We, rather than saying, do I have the right result, how accurate does that result need to be, and whether or not this, does the result make sense. So that's what I have been seeing a lot of the AI tools um, of the use of the NRC. There's also the common uses of machine learning to be able to have some type of predictive analytics, as well as the area of using natural language processing to be able to better understand the NRC jargon. I think everybody knows that the nuclear sector, we have our own jargon, so it's really hard to identify uh, what do we mean about a specific term at, uh, at the regulations. So those have, where we have been seeing the use of AI, the majority of it is mostly of generative AI. How can I learn better about my data? How can I be are able to better crowdsource my data, not only from the NRC, but from other sources of data? So that's what I see, at least in the initial terms, where AI could be used at the NRC. Thanks, Luis. Go ahead, Yeah, a, a great comment, Luis. And even what you said earlier about you know finding fulfillment in the workplace, and I think uh, if, Anyone who's with the NRC and understands our culture data, you've hopefully or will hear the term blue behaviors. Um, and and we've, we've shown through our data that we have a strong desire for uh, an environment that is more humanistic encouraging, where there's support and um, feedback and mentoring and those type of things, knowledge management. Um, also being more self-actualized where you know, you're enjoying your work, you're enjoying the people that you work with, uh, you're finding fulfillment in the mission. So these are some of the things that we're seeing with our workforce that are their values um, and that we're trying to shift our culture to match that. These are good points. Would you say that it's similar at EPRI where we're looking for that self-actualization and um, the acknowledgement and sort of willingness to step out I would say we see small segments that want different things. So I'm not sure what blue behaviors are. I want to learn about that. Um, we have uh, a lot of opportunities for people to participate in cross-collaborative discussions. And those are fantastic, but honestly, it's only a small percentage of our, our, our teams. And it's the same people all the time that kind of like that part of things. Um, I don't know. I'm kind of interested to go ask some people what what they think about this, what they're looking for in their job. I would say the um, the newer employees we have, they're really tied into the mission of nuclear. They're here, they're in this industry to save the world, and they're cl crystal clear about that. And there's no time, so that they have a great sense of urgency. But in terms of you know what is personally fulfilling, I'm not sure I have a good beat on that for our whole organization. Okay. Uh, I did some interviews for some summer student hires, and I asked them um, to talk about products that they had delivered for their stakeholders. And more than once, I got the question, what is a stakeholder? <laughs> and in my mind, I thought, that means I've been in the government too long. Um, <laughs> But going back to your point about KPIs and, you know, the younger generation believes that it, nuclear is now, it's a green energy, we've got to absolutely pursue it. So how do we engage them and give them the success capability that they need? If they're motivated and it's got to be right now, and we have large bureaucratic organizations or semi-large bureaucratic organizations, be it, you know, power production or otherwise, um, how do we engage them in a way that speaks to this 
behavior of, of being willing to take a risk and take the chance and be passionate while also doing the time cards and the administrative things that we all function on. Well, I think it's, a, it's asking, probably asking, right? Asking. How could we do this faster? That I think is the big drive right now is the urgency, the speed. We, we have to be faster as a whole industry. And there's a desire to say, what's the, what's the payback on something financially? Um, but I don't think that resonates with a lot of the new workforce. But how can we do this faster? How can we accelerate it? Is a great driver for doing things more innovatively. And we, we need to ask, how can we do it differently? And, li and listen and then think, can we, can we actually do this? Uh, I was going to share a recent story. We were briefing our management about something that um, um, my, my team was... Uh, proposing a timeline and for that particular step of the process uh, uh, one of our our younger staff proposed well these were planning that this may take one or two months and then uh, one of our senior managers uh, just it, it broke my heart because he just broke the news well last time we tried this it took 13 months so so I think there's a <laughs> there's an opportunity to work with this younger generation to help them understand that, yeah, we have aspirational goals and we have uh, ideas in our mind of how things could go, but, but the, the reality is that we need to find a balance in, in what we would like to do and what is feasible. And, and that is the part that we just may want to be more sensitive about because we don't want to disencourage this younger generation and just tell them, hey, this is not the way that it, it will go. It would be more about, well, let's work together. Let's see how we can get this going and explain the steps in the process, explain the intricacies in each of these processes that they don't understand yet because they're new. So there, there are opportunities to really mentor and help this younger uh, workforce to uh, be uh, more aware of the limitations that we have because the reality is that we have aspirations, but but we also have limitations, and, and those limitations may just be part of the process, and we may not be able to get rid of them, or, or we will. But in the meantime, communication is key. So uh, let's just talk and help this uh, younger uh, workforce to uh, just cope with what we have. <laughs> So our, our stakeholders, uh, those who are interested in what we're delivering in our products and deliverables, uh, maybe they can help us with moving the needle from one month, from 13 months to maybe more than one month, but not 13 months. <laughs> okay. I want to say something <clears> or <throat> what uh, Milton talked about. And I think with this new generation, uh, what is important to them is to have a seat at the table. Uh, we as an organization, we tend to be more focused on the hierarchy and this new generation, they want to play a key role early in the game and they have to have a seat at the table at all levels of organization. So we need to be able to empower them to have a position in whatever decision making we're trying to do because that is going to be able to change the way the NRC works as part of our culture. They need to have a sense that they have a seat at the table. We heard today with Commissioner Caputo in her remarks uh, of how women, they need to have a seat at the table. The same thing has to happen with this new generation. We need to allow the opportunities for them to have a seat at the table. That's a really good point. A seat at the table and to be heard will give that confidence to then be willing to take risks. At the end of the day, there's an element of fear, I think. We have our processes that we've been doing, and sometimes we're afraid to experiment with something new because we know that this thing works, and although it takes 13 months maybe, um, we know that we can get there eventually. And if we change it, are we going to be able to do it in two months, or is it going to take us 26 months because we changed something and we broke something along the way? Very good questions. I'd like to go ahead and ask our um, final polling question um, and ask you for your input on where is innovation needed the most at the NRC? So um, while, you're, while you're working on those, I want to thank our panelists for answering the question about our mechanisms for success. At the end of the day, change 
is um, a difference. There's a change in the difference in the power, the control, the, the tools, or the structure. So we have to change what our definitions of success are sometimes. And we need to ask, and we need to employ some balance to be able to move our initiatives and ideas forward. So I see we, we're getting some, some comments in, and it looks like Unfortunately, licensing processes are taking the biggest hit on the areas that need the most um, innovation at NRC. I will say that um, there's lots of creative thoughts out there. We've got to figure out how to employ them within our bureaucratic structures to make sure that we're doing what needs to be done. We're checking the right blocks and um, accomplishing the safety mission first while also improving um, what we can to make our processes better. But really, innovation is needed everywhere. Um, we all have pockets. There are things from the timesheet you were talking about to you know the first day introduction. Um, all these things we can impact, um, but they sometimes feel very incremental in like millimeters as opposed to feet. But part of being an innovator is to keep trying and to keep after things and to keep working them. And um, I had a colleague in a previous organization who said, I'm just so tired of explaining this thing again. Why do people need me to explain why we need to innovate? And it's like, well, that's part of innovation is you have to keep after it. It's about perseverance and persistence and gathering the like minds together to, to be your champion counsel and help you work through how we can sell the idea better and, and make that mark and make those changes. So I would say that exponential change is possible. This nexus that you've heard here, um, people, the, the um, culture, and the effective technology are all implementation readiness driven types of things that create that structure that we can build on. We can innovate if we put our will into it and we keep going and we keep trying. Um, there's opportunity. You've all touched on ideas about balance and understanding what our stakeholders view a reward as and how do we define success? How do we move our culture from where it is to what we want? And how do we incorporate the changes? The changes in us, the changes in the new people that are joining, changes in the technology. How do we pull all that together um, one step at a time? Um, I welcome some reactions from my panelists. I'm going to ask um, Ken, who's been patiently sitting over there taking questions. I think I was supposed to have picked up something so I could see the questions and read them. Oh, we have some great questions. So I'll give my panelists an opportunity to think about that they want to react before we start taking some of these questions. Um, and we will continue having this conversation. But I just want to affirm to you that exponential change is possible. So I don't know if you want to reach. OK. Join us on stage. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> Good <laughs> questions. Wow. All right. You are an inquisitive bunch. <laughs> Thank you. It's all the people in the front row here. I kept seeing them typing <laughs> yeah. questions. Yeah. <laughs> I think I've left enough time to get to, s to s maybe most of these. We'll see. Um, all right, question for Tina. As EPRI looks at industries in nuclear and other, what are common ways companies prioritize and decide which innovative ideas to pursue and dedicate resources to? Do you want me to repeat that or have you got it? Um, yeah, I, I've got that. Um, so we actually have a part of our company, we, ha we have something called a global, innovation effectiveness um, cohort. A bunch of companies from around the world that are uh, sharing their ideas on what they do with innovation. And one of the very common things I see, which I don't know if this is a great practice, is people, um, most of the time people say we wanna be innovative. 
So we're going to have a way to collect innovative ideas, and then hopefully we're going to have a commitment to, to, to implement those. And so a common part of that initial process is some way to collect ideas, and then it goes to some kind of committee who determines which ones will move forward. And that committee is almost always made up of senior people in the company, very entrenched in how we do things the way we've always done it. And a lot of the really innovative things seem to get filtered out in that process. So that's what I see as a common approach and what we've been teaching ourselves as we compare notes and figure out what works really well is you have to do something different than that because you don't want to filter out the most radical ideas right from the start. You wanna have some other kind of process that moves ideas along, considers things that don't seem obvious even in the first part, and that's really hard to do. So I don't know quite how to do it, but I think that's an area to focus on. Okay, thank you very much. And I learned something, once you touch the star, it disappears, so I'm glad you didn't need me to repeat it. <laughs> So those of you that haven't gone yet, you now know. All right, this next one is for Luis. Um, with the NRC as process-based, how does NRC management make sure that good ideas are accepted and adopted by skeptics? Hmm. Oh, that's a hard question. Let <laughs> I think on, on that aspect, it's just to show at the end of the day what's the outcome that we're trying to achieve. Um, it's always good to be skeptical at the end of the day because uh, we really need to be thinking about what we are doing today is for the group of the American people um, and the public. What we're trying to do is to be able to be more efficient in the way that we're doing business. So in that aspect, what we try to do is to show the benefits of the idea rather than the risk. Obviously, we need to put the guardrails so once we start developing an idea, but we also have to be very keen on what is the benefit of this idea. It's okay to be skeptic, but at the end of the day, we need to be longing for the C, okay? How is this idea is gonna benefit not only the NRC, but also the members of the public, because those are the people that we're serving. We're serving our nation to, to do better, so. Thank you, Chris. I'm sorry, Luis. Uh, Luis, see, like a Luis, Milton, Chris I'm not, the next I'm not confused next. now. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, you have the next question. Um, how do you see culture impacting the ability to innovate? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. Um, I think, you know, if we look at culture, we're looking at our capacity to uh, produce and perform. And uh, having a culture that not only says that we want to innovate, but actually the day-to-day -day is encouraging that innovation, rewarding that innovation, like you talked about, Tina, um, inspiring that innovation. Um, I think part of our data talks about um, knowing the business process, right? So our entire organization, so understanding our mission, understanding our day-to-day -day, uh, will help inspire some of this innovation and things that we can do differently. So I think the culture plays a very integral role in that. That, and I'll just use the example of, of a new, new employee because we, we talked about that earlier. Someone coming into our environment, our, our work environment, can they say, oh, they're serious about innovation here? Mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that's what we want the response to be. So I think culture has a tremendous impact on our ability to innovate. Um, and I think that the shift that we're trying to make now where we're looking at our specific day-to-day -day behaviors, starting with our leadership, um, can help drive that innovation and really inspire it. Thank you. It's a great response, Chris. <laughs> All right. Um, Milton, when innovation begins, lots of people instinctively balk at change. How and where in the innovation process do you handle this? You want me to read it again? Yes. Okay. <laughs> when innovation begins, lots of people instinctively balk at change. How and where in the innovation process do you handle this? When you balk at change? Balk, as in they're resistant, they, they don't want to, the knee-jerk reaction is, don't want to do that. Well, that could happen in different stages of innovation. Like, it could happen at the beginning of 
presenting an idea, it could happen once the idea has been assessed and, and that you understand that it's actually feasible and then you go to the implementation part of it and there, there are no uh, like maybe resources or, or time to make it happen. So it, it could happen, uh, but what we try to do in the, with the innovation program is prepare the innovator to cope with that resistance because it, it is part of the process. Like you will find, you will always have challenges. You will always have people that will say, no, this is just not gonna work. But how do you keep thriving how do you identify the right time to present your idea? How do you build your story to perhaps just convince other people and keep presenting that idea in other places that may be better received? That that would be the strategy, but unfortunately, that's part of the process. So it could happen anytime, and whenever it happens, we try to support the innovators in just coping with that resistance. That's a great point. Um, I heard someone say that we all have lots of great ideas, but when it comes to the actual implementation, sometimes we struggle. So um, I think that you've all sort of touched on that and the need to reward and create space for innovation. Um, it also incorporates a little bit of process change and a willingness to stop and say, hey, this impacts my work directly but maybe I can learn something from it. Maybe there is a piece of this. It doesn't have to be the you know complete upheaval. We're gonna we're not gonna do timesheets anymore. We're just gonna pay people. It's like no, we can do some incremental changes maybe in our process to make it more friendly. Um, and there are other probably better illustrations that y'all are thinking of. Um, but the idea that you know you just have this an initial reaction of I don't want to change. Um, I, I don't like change. Well, it's part of life, and it's one of those things that we have to work through. And if we want to innovate, if we want to see the successes in innovation, and Vana is down here nodding her head vigorously, um, we, we have to check that initial reaction and say, I don't want to change, but, and I think I can improve. Maybe it's incremental. Maybe it's dramatic. Um, but a pause to think, and resist that initial, no, I don't want to change. Um, you're all looking at me. Okay, I'll stop talking. <laughs> I still have 18 minutes. So um, let's, let's get through some more of these questions that Ken has identified for us. Um, this one's directed to the NRC staff. How do you support innovation in an environment where people feel too busy to innovate? Go can ahead. I, can I jump in on that? Yes. Because we have something really cool we did. Um, we, we, that was what we heard. And we did surveys of our team. Why can't we be in more innovative? It was always, I don't have time to innovate. And so we started this thing. It's called Starlight Labs. It's a little hard to define what it is. But one aspect of it is we have regular um, virtual engagements, I'll call them, because they're not really, really meetings, on a topic. And everybody's invited in the whole company. And we'll have a couple people that might know a little bit about that topic. You know, it could be, I don't know, using LIDAR to, to uh, survey an area or something. And it's just brainstorming. We have a virtual whiteboard. People talk and think about how might I use this in my area? What have I had experience with? What are all the problems? Why you don't want to use this thing? That all can come out in that space. And miraculously, because there was a meeting they could add to their calendar, it gave people you know, an hour a month to be innovative. But then those conversations really propelled a lot of other uh, interactions with people that didn't even know each other or didn't work together. So that's something to consider a model I'd be happy to franchise for everybody. <laughs> Starlight Labs coming to a department near you. <laughs> well, we, we do have something similar, which is the, the jam. And, and that is something that uh, happened last year, two years ago. And, and so, so there has been those uh, opportunities where we 
grand time for everyone to come together and just brainstorm. And there were like some like live boards and, and some uh, uh, interactive tools that were uh, prepared for the staff to just like have a work cloud and propose just words and ideas and just articulate what could be the solution for certain common themes. So so that, that has happened is something that we have learned a lot from. And there's a lot of information that, that has been processed and that probably still needs to be processed because there was a lot of information that yes. was collected. Uh, but uh, certainly it is, it is very important to keep looking for that time where people are allowed to provide ideas and be part of those like thinking, uh, like brainstorming kind of exercises because uh, it is true we're busy and, and, and it's just, uh, you know, we need to allow time for people to contribute. That's a great point. And there is, in fact, more things coming out of the, the jam. The analysis of ideas and the inputs are still ongoing. Um, I don't know if, if um, research or EDOs. Sure. So, yeah, it's, it's a great question. I think um, one thing I've learned being a part of the organization is everyone's busy and there's uh, high workloads all around. Um, I think there's a, another perspective to that question. Um, I think if we, we talked about the bureaucracy and the way government works, sometimes you have a flood of work coming in and you don't have the people yet and you have to wait for a budget to hire and so you kind of stay in this kind of chronic cycle of, of not having the resources you need and I've been a part of other organizations that, that really that kind of defined our, my tenure there uh, dealing with backlogs and so I think sometimes having those heavy workloads can actually put a little bit of pressure to, to innovate and in the moment think, okay, there's got to be a better way to do this. We've got to come up with something different because this isn't sustainable. So I think there's another perspective with respect to necessity heavy, being yeah, the mother of invention. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, that's a good point. And sometimes, you know, if you think about, you hear about initiatives, you know, we have this initiative, we're going to do this thing. It's like if it's an initiative, that means it's not embedded in the cultural DNA. And so, you know, how how do we go about embedding these things? You've got your your Starlight um, Labs, and we have the Jam periodically, and you've got Innovate 2.0. You're constantly talking about culture. You're um, on the, the cutting or maybe more appropriately bleeding edge of um, artificial intelligence. And, and what we're doing. So how do we continue to embed those things into our DNA so they're not just the shiny new object? I think an area that I, that I found, at least that we do in our group, that even though it's not related to AI, uh, we set up priorities of, okay, this is what we're going to be spending our time. So every two weeks, my group basically sits down, and I'm basically not even in the group. And they talk some on themselves of how can they can better improve the way that we work. And I think that's beautiful because it's something that they have done organically without me even asking. And I'm not even part of that discussion, but I get the, the outcomes and the results during the branch meetings and, and through the side conversations. And I think it's about that to be able to allow staff and because you prioritize what is important. Obviously, we need to be able to prioritize our mission, but we also need to be able to prioritize. They need to have their time to talk among themselves because that has to happen at all levels of organizations. So it's just to allow that space for our people to be able to talk and having that whiteboard because that's basically what they do. So, But that has done... That has happened organically without even me asking, and I think that's part of a healthy cultural organization that that happens without even me as a leader telling them how to do it. It's a great point. All right, um, I know we're, we're we're drawing to a close. If we can change our slide to the final one, we've got some winks. If you want to get in touch with us, uh, and on to the next question, y'all are not off the hook yet. Um, how do we address the ask to provide data showing the success of innovation or return on investment when a lot of the innovation in terms of process improvement cannot easily be tracked in the immediate or even near term? Any takers on that one? It, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's part of the uh, value of innovation. Not everything will be quantified in terms of, of pennies and, and, and FTE hours, you know, there's a lot of uh, value that comes out of making things easier and, and just having ideas being considered for people to have the motivation and the, the, 
the satisfaction of contributing to the organization. So not not all the benefits that we are seeing can be quantified. And and it's uh, it's something that we're trying to do better at because when we captured success stories and, and implemented ideas, uh, the innovators don't always know how to quantify the benefits out of it. They know that they are doing less work. They know that they are things are easier, but it's not always easy to quantify that benefit. So it, it is an area that we're trying to do better at, but, but the reality is that most of the innovations and the benefit that has come from the ideas that we have tracked I may not be able to be quantified. But there's that qualitative value of, hey, we're doing things better. We are using newer methods, newer tools. We are keeping up with what's happening outside the agency. And that by itself makes us look better. We are more professional. More, We're more on top of, of, of what's happening. So it's, it's a matter of just conveying these benefits in a way that, that can be appreciated. I think this question speaks to the results. You know, how do you demonstrate the results of this innovation? How do you prove that what was is inferior in some way to what is? Uh, and it's it's sort of like one of my, my new favorite examples of how much money did we spend going from typewriters to computers? And how do you quantify what you saved or what you spent? You know, we're not buying typewriter ribbon. We're still buying paper. But we can do so much more with a computer than we could with a typewriter. So how would you quantify all the things that you get out of that computer versus what you didn't get out of the typewriter? But the typewriter wasn't designed for that. So um, I think this question is a little bit of that chicken and egg kind of um, aspect of you've got to be able to show and demonstrate that Yes, where we were was one place, and where we've gone to is something else, and there is value in there. And some of our organizations, including mine, will pretzel ourselves into trying to find a dollar figure or a time figure um, to apply to that, but it can be extremely challenging. Um, I don't know if you find the same thing in in EPRI. Um, We're forever saying, well, the government doesn't really save money because we're not a money-making institution, but sometimes we are yeah i think i think we definitely have um sort of achieved the driver of if we aggregate all of the industry's data there's things that are possible that we can't even articulate today right and um we definitely have challenges as we keep going forward data is becoming more valuable to people and a a greater desire to protect it or sell it Um, But maybe a quick example of something we were able to do that we didn't know we were going to do. We embarked on a process to aggregate um, work order data so that we could understand better preventive maintenance strategies and and optimize that around cost, value-based maintenance. But one of the things we found is that by having all that data, we were then able to also analyze the time it took to do all these pieces of work and provide insight back on that. Where where could there be a focus to reduce the time and therefore reduce the money? So I think you know going forward as we have all these more powerful tools that will continue to be developed, it's more about what you know what the value will be in the f- further future because you took these steps today to build this body of information or these capabilities or these skills or these innovation muscles. Um, it, it is hard when you then encounter the CFO and they want the payback in a year or <laughs> whatever the time period is. But I think, I think there's that aspect of inspiring by the possibility. Inspiring about the possibility. I like it. That's a great phrase. We still have time for um, a question or two more, but I want to remind you that I want your feedback. So um, if you haven't scanned the QR code, please do so and go to the feedback tab and give us some actionable information uh, on your thoughts about this session because you clearly have lots of questions. So thank you for those. Um, Here's a question for the panel. How do each of the organizations maintain energy around innovation and maintain staffing levels to make innovation happen? Well, we, we have uh, allocated uh, um, 
FTEs to manage our innovation program. However, we need to give a big shout out to all the volunteers because it's just not possible to run the whole program with just you know a number of people. Uh, it, it's it's an agency program, and there's a lot of networking, a lot of communications, a lot of uh, briefings, a lot of activities that are happening in different segments of, of the agency. So certainly. Uh, having that additional support from people that are motivated towards innovation makes makes a difference. Very good. Luis? I think on this one, it's, it's more about what is the end goal. Uh, and I would like to read something that I read the other day. Uh, I think you guys remember when Netflix, back in the day, they were able to send you a DVD uh, to your home, and that's the way that we were able to watch uh, movies and then but they did something that I found that was really interesting of, they found around in the, the early 20s that that model was changing and they needed to be able to change and they were one of the early adopters of AI. And what I found, what I was actually reading the quote, which I found really interesting, is that we need to be able to inspire people, and, and this is the quote that I found, if you want to build a ship, do not gather people to collect wood or assign them tasks but instead teach them to yearn for the badness of the sea. And I think that's where we need to be able to tell them the possibilities of how can, what is beyond the sea, what is actually, what's the promise of AI. So rather than telling them, oh, day one, come to the organization and I want you to do X, Y, and Z, we need to step back and tell them what is the art of the possibility? What is, what is possible to the use of data, to the use of AI? And I think if we can instill that early to all of our new generation and even to our existing staff, that's what I can see that we have a, a culture that it will be able to sustain itself even when we are gone, so. Thank you. Well, we have just a few minutes left. Are there any additional thoughts that you'd like to share or should I ask you another hard question? I'll jump in because I wanted to plug something. Um, we have had um, for several years now a series of meetings called the Global Forum for Nuclear Innovation, something that you all might be interested in. Our third one is uh, gonna be this summer, last week of June um, in Miami. And um, we, are, we have as our, our theme this time, Ambition into Action. And to prepare for that meeting, we did a large survey of the industry, so I thought I'd just share these results with you. Um, we, we asked um, about, is there enough innovation in the industry? You know, are there ideas? And 83% of the people said there is, the industry is full of ambition. But 77% uh, believe there's a disparity between the ambition that we have and our ability to turn that into action. So we, um, through the survey, came up with five barriers that people identified. I think you guys will be happy to know none of them was regulatory. <laughs> um, so, Amen. you know, it was financial planning and resources, uh, resi resistance to change or sticking with the status quo, unclear definition of the goal, too little leadership, and inadequate planning or research. And so those themes will be explored at that meeting this summer if, you're, if that's something that you're interested in following. Well, that sounds very engaging and interesting. Um, you said it's in Miami, in the middle of the summer? It's in Miami, great hotel rates though, <laughs> last week of June. <laughs> all right, great hotel rates, we all like those. All right, I would like to say thank you, um, Milton, Tina, Chris, Louise, Thank you for coming and sharing your thoughts, having an engaging conversation. Thank you to you all for asking some fantastic questions. Uh, we did not get to all of them, um, and we'll explore the ways that we can um, respond to those and um, give you more insights on creativity and culture and innovation. And Luis has an AI session coming up um, Please come tomorrow at 3.30 p.m. <laughs> we get to have all these thoughtful discussions in the end of the day. Goodness. Um, mercifully, none of you heard our stomach growling. Uh, I hope that you have a wonderful evening, and thank you for joining us um, for this technical session. And go forth and be creative and innovative and ask us questions out in the hallway if you have them. Um, I know you have more of them, uh, and thank you. 
Uh, have a great rest of the Rick.